uh, present lecture, which uh, I think uh, you know that it's part of a seminar which uh, gloss uh, books on, on architecture. Um, so I, I really want to insist on, on this idea of the seminar, no? which in principle is not really a lecture, um, but something that is in theory should be more a sort of uh, interactive discussion, but of course, because the time is very uh, compressed and I pour much more uh, things that what I'm, I should in fact uh, <laughs> uh, present to you in order to allow this discussion to happen. Uh, but of course the seminar really has this nature of glossing on, on books. And I, I really want to insist on this particular aspect because I really hope that uh, this seminar, in a way, is an invitation to reopen these books. Uh, my experience, but please uh, object to this if you think uh, this is not true, uh, is that there is a tendency in, in, in architectural discourse, but, and I have actually have been a, in a symposium Friday at Princeton, uh, which is supposed to be the mecca of, of architectural theory, and after one year of, of, of discussions and presentations, I mean, I, I got the feeling, but that was not the only time I got this feeling, that people are mentioning books and uh, canonical books on, on architecture. Uh, but my feeling is that uh, nobody really reads them. Uh, so there is a kind of strange uh, situation where we talk all the time about Alberti, Le Corbusier, uh, you know, Benjamin, uh, um, and then what you get are always the same quotes, no? the same kind of passages that you realize are exactly those passages that you often find in readers or anthologies. Or... So I, I, I think that, uh, that um, it's, uh, it's very important to reread these books. I mean, as almost if they were uh, written yesterday. I mean, I think sometimes it's a very good exercise to kind of, uh, of course, remove uh, all this kind of literature, bibliography that these books have, in a way, produced, uh, and to assume that, in a way, uh, we are almost like uh, starting from scratch, and, and we kind of read these books as they <coughs> appeared uh, when they were published. Um, and this is exactly what I think this seminar is kind of trying to insist on. I mean, the idea of that, um, you take these books and, of course, uh, as I said uh, in the previous lectures, uh, most of these books are really difficult to read. Um, for example, Vitruvius de Architettura is a book that is uh, quite unbearable. Uh, you can, I mean, I, and I have to confess, I've never read the entire Vitruvius de Architettura because there are passages which are very difficult and uh, accessible only if you are ex very well trained to read certain uh, issues that are uh, understandable for someone who has a more, let's say, general understanding of, of that specific content. Uh, so I'm not saying that one should really read them all from beginning to the end. Also because some of these books are quite encyclopedic in their own scope. So like an encyclopedia is not something you read from beginning to the end. I mean, you, you read a specific chapter or a specific part uh, when you are basically addressing a specific problem. But there are other books, uh, and I think this is really the case of the books that I'm going to discuss today, which you can easily read. And I have to say they are also quite beautiful. Um, I think Le Corbusier, uh, Verse en Architecture, uh, Towards an Architecture, is a very beautiful book. It's extremely well written. It's very smart. Um, it's a book that uh, has a strong uh, literary quality. I mean, Le Corbusier is a writer. He's someone who really has uh, an incredible ability to convey ideas through words, and not by accident in his uh, Heidi Card, as it is uh, well known, uh, he described himself as a writer, not as an architect. Of course, that has a legal issue, the fact that Le Corbusier, as you might know, never heard uh, a diploma uh, in uh, architecture, so he was not uh, entitled uh, with the 
let's say, legal uh, title of an architect. So that's the reason why he could only call himself a writer. Uh, but I think uh, for Le Corbusier, writing is a, is a technique, is a medium, which, uh, like in the case of Alberti, is ex or maybe a recent, uh, recent case, uh, in the case of Colas, uh, where writing is really used as a, not only as a primary instrument no, to, to talk and to discuss about architecture, but uh, there is actually an extreme literary quality no, that shows how, uh, for Le Corbusier, uh, the message was not uh, the whole thing, also the medium, the form through which this message was delivered was very important. So in that sense, I think, uh, I, I hope, I mean, I'm sure that all of you have read this book, uh, so I don't have to convince you that it's a, a beautiful book. There is a, also a recent translation made uh, recently by the Getty Center, uh, which I think has uh, really um, made uh, a very, I mean, strong justice on the literary quality of, of the book. So, um, in that sense, I, I really think uh, uh, it's important that uh, maybe after this, and maybe uh, also for the other books, you, you, you read this, this book. The second book, actually, uh, that I'm going to present today is actually some, something that maybe very few of you have read for a very technical reason. It's a book that uh, has never been translated uh, in English, uh, and um, an English translation of this book is going to appear, actually, I think next week, if I'm not wrong. So it's a book that has been only recently uh, translated. The original name, um, the original title of this book is uh, Grostad Architecture, which the English translator has translated as Metropolis Architecture. I personally have problems with this translation because it takes for granted that you can translate the German word Grostad, which literally means the big city, but has a very specific, uh, let's say, connotation with metropolis. Uh, and I, I have to say, I'm not sure that uh, Grostad, uh, the German term Grostad and, and metropolis are, are the same, actually, they, they means the same thing. But nevertheless, that's, that's the way it, it was translated. Also because apparently that's what I've been told by the translator, the t a title like the architecture of the big city or the great city was not really editorially um, presentable. And that's actually why Metropolis Architecture became the, the title of the book. Um, but I, um, actually, it's, uh, it's really funny that this book has been only recently translated because I think, like Le Corbusier uh, towards an architecture, I, I, would, I would argue that it's uh, perhaps one of the most, if not the most important book on, on the very basics idea of, of modern architecture. And maybe uh, Hilbert Seimer has not the same literary quality of uh, Le Corbusier, it's much more schematic, it's much more straightforward, uh, but uh, something that really characterizes his uh, approach to architecture that unlike many architects of his time, he was uh, very analytical, very precise. I mean, in his book, it's not a propaganda book that try to promote uh, modern architecture, but is a book that uh, address how uh, architecture in its uh, scale of a building can address the new problems that affect the, the uh, idea of the new uh, capitalist uh, metropolis. Uh, actually, Bersheimer is the first uh, architectural theorist uh, to really address the problem of how capital, capitalism uh, basically uh, takes the form of the modern city before actually uh, Hilbert Seimer, all architects, uh, including Le Corbusier, almost take for granted that there is a sort of uh, linear evolution from the traditional city to the modern city. No? Uh, well, actually, uh, Hilbert Seimer is the first uh, to clearly state that with the advent of capitalism, uh, there is a quantum leap uh, in the uh, development of the city, and so the scale of problems uh, uh, is completely different. So Hilbert Seimer really makes that kind of statement clear. That's why in Metropolis architecture, there is hardly a reference to the traditional or ancient uh, city, where in other books like uh, Stuben or Baumeister or, or uh, Sitte, no? this kind of reference to the traditional city is always very important. With Hilbert Seimer, that kind of link uh, is completely 
broken, uh, and in fact, he starts from the very uh, beginning of the 19th century uh, capitalist uh, uh, city. Now, uh, as, 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 as you know, actually, one of the attempts of the seminar is to not just gloss the books, but to link them within a much broader context, which is uh, what I characterize with the term ethos, which is the character uh, of a particular historical time in which these books have been uh, written. Uh, today, actually, it's, it's very difficult to really uh, introduce this, uh, let's say, context, uh, because uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's much clo closer to us, so historically is far more detailed than what I will be able to, to sketch uh, in this presentation. So what I've, what I've done is I have tried to really uh, schematize uh, this through a series of figures uh, let's say, uh, protagonist of the historical time in which uh, these two books are written. I mean, you see the dates here are very crucial. One is written in 1920, published actually, in 1923, and, and the other one in 1927. So it's a very, very crucial period because it's in between two uh, fundamental historical events that will definitely change the course uh, of uh, 20th century history. Uh, of course, the first is the Bolshevik Revolution, 1917, uh, which in fact introduced uh, a new, uh, I mean, socialism no longer as a sort of uh, aspiration to overthrow uh, capitalism, but really as a state uh, reality. And of course, this will be a major challenge uh, for uh, capitalist, uh, let's say, for the capitalist world. I mean, for the first time, the capitalist world is confronted with the uh, political reality that is uh, based on the rejection, basically, of the fundamental tenets of this particular uh, ethos, which was, uh, as you know, important for Europe since at least the, the 16th century. Uh, and the second event, of course, uh, even, well, almost with the same kind of magnitude, uh, is the 1929 uh, crisis, uh, which is the first uh, big, uh, let's say, large-scale crisis of capitalism, uh, in a way comparable to the one that we are living uh, in the last uh, four years, with the same kind of really impact, uh, which definitely will change the way not only capitalism will work, but the way actually capitalism will be conceived as a sort of uh, form of mastery. And of course, uh, what is interesting that the, the content of these books is really related to these two uh, events, which are somehow has to be seen in a way consequential. So I think this, uh, uh, the, the, the events of the Bolshevik revolution is, uh, is very important. I mean, we, it's really actually, you know, the famous historian who just passed away recently, Eric Hosbaum has written a very important book about the 20th century, which he called it the short uh, century, uh, because for Hosbaum, who was a, not, uh, let's say, a neutral historian, but uh, he had a very specific, uh, let's say, position in his writing history. Uh, 20th century has, two, uh, has an opening and a closing date, uh, which are related precisely to the history of the main subject of the 20th century, the, the working class, which is 1917-1989, which is exactly the beginning and the end of the Soviet uh, Union. I think a very important figure, of course, is uh, Lenin. Uh, Lenin actually, in a way, reinvented uh, uh, the legacy of Marx. Uh, compared to Marx, Lenin was a far more rudimental uh, theorist of uh, politics. But uh, unlike uh, uh, Marx, Lenin uh, put forward precisely what uh, Marx was missing, a political project that was able to transform uh, socialism uh, and communism into a state, uh, let's say, uh, reality, which actually was exactly what he invented with the idea of the Soviets, uh, which were, for Lenin, the, the very, let's say, political subject that would reinvent modern politics from a class uh, proletarian perspective. The Soviets is, a, is, a, is an English, uh, it is a Russian word that means councils, and the councils were those political elites that, uh, in Lenin's view, had to basically lead the, the revolution. A very, another very important figure uh, of that time is, of, of course, Rosa uh, Luxemburg, 
why I'm pairing Galienin with uh, Rosa Luxemburg, because in a way, not only Luxembourg had a, a very important role in the uh, German revolutions that happened in Germany uh, in the uh, late 10s, early 20s, after the defeat of, of, of uh, Germany in the First World War. Uh, one of the most important revolution was the Va Bavarian Revolution of 1919, which was actually repressed uh, uh, quite uh, early on, so it did not succeed like the Russian Revolution to establish uh, a new uh, socialist uh, uh, government, but uh, I mean, of course, like any uh, tumult or uh, revolt, uh, this uh, event has a, a, an enduring effect on the history of German uh, capitalism, especially uh, during the Weimar Republic in the 1920s, uh, because uh, of course, uh, faced with this uh, incredible, unprecedented potential of a proletarian revolution, uh, uh, industry and the politics of uh, industrialization had a fundamental primary role uh, in not only making people productive, but also giving to people uh, a form of mastery, which was uh, in a way important uh, in order to uh, frame this kind of uh, impetus towards the possibility of workers to uh, rebel against their living and, and working condition. And this is actually a very important uh, aspect. I mean, from the beginning, architecture, modern architecture, really side with that kind of concern, you know? And the famous uh, statement by Le Corbusier, architecture of revolution, address precisely this problem. You know? Unless we actually uh, reorganize uh, social and especially labor uh, conditions, uh, unless we actually reorganize them, uh, there will be a revolution. So the the problem of architecture is, is to help the, the ruling classes, especially, let's say, the ruling classes that are more sensible and advanced in terms of rethinking the idea of uh, production to prevent that revolution to happen, which is basically to transform uh, social and political relationship by means of uh, a new city or a new living uh, and working uh, uh, environment. And this is actually something very important because as you have seen with the past uh, presentations, uh, architecture uh, is always part of this reformist uh, project no? that always try to not uh, repress uh, conflict because that, that is impossible, but to transform uh, conflict uh, into a trigger for a transformation. No? But transformation not in the revolutionary terms like uh, the working class had uh, wished for, but uh, in terms of uh, making actually advancing uh, capitalist uh, uh, domination. And this is for me a very important point because I believe, and this is an argument that I launch, launch as a challenge to, to you, I don't think that there, should, that there could be a revolutionary architecture. I mean, I don't think architecture, even it's with its uh, best uh, intentions, uh, will be always, always uh, a, an instrument of uh, let's say, um, if, of course, not of repression, but the reform, no? and this reform is, always has this kind of theological impetus to avoid that things get worse, which sometimes is precisely the way things can change, by the way. So we have to take in mind this fundamental agency no? of, of architecture. I don't think that, I mean, this, even if we want to be the most uh, open uh, activist, uh, um, you know, full of good intentions, we, this kind of subjectivity will always remain within, within us. I don't think there is a way we can overcome that. And for me, that's why I think that Le Corbusier's statement, architecture revolution, is one of the best definition of architecture. I personally don't think there is a better definition uh, to architecture than to make, to put this kind of dualism uh, uh, as, or dilemma, if you want, uh, as the very foundation of what is the purpose for, for the architectural project. Wh whether this is good or bad, I leave it to you. I have personally clear ideas, <laughs> but uh, I don't think this is uh, interesting for today. Of course, uh, as I said, one of the fundamental uh, consequences of the way uh, workers start to organize themselves and, and rebel against uh, capital is the reorganization of labor. The organization of labor is one of the fundamental instruments through which capital, in a way, attempt to disarm uh, a possibility of a revolution. 
uh, one of the key figures of this uh, process of restructuring is for sure Henry Ford, who is a, an engineer who in the early, let's say late 19th century, uh, focused on uh, the problem of mass production. He's an entrepreneur who actually tried to mass produce um, automobiles, uh, cars, and in uh, uh, early 20th century succeed to design uh, a, a sort of uh, model for a car, the famous Ford uh, T, uh, which he uh, intended to be not uh, a luxury uh, good, which was exactly what cars were at the time, but really a mass-produced item for uh, the middle class, which uh, of course implied the fact that uh, cost of production for such a rather technologically advanced uh, commodity had to be uh, lower uh, as much as possible. But the stroke of genius uh, of uh, Ford was precisely uh, to couple the lowering of cost of production uh, with uh, the increase of wage uh, for workers, which is a, um, in, in, the, I mean, in, in a way um, paradox a paradoxical deal. No? On one end, you try to lower uh, the cost of production, and we know that cost of productions are mostly uh, the wage for who actually are uh, working, for basically the, the workers. Uh, but at the same time, of course, it's precisely this kind of uh, process that very often trigger uh, the revolt of the workers against their uh, working condition. I mean, workers are not usually, are not um, interested in, you know, a better world uh, or uh, equality like the revolutionaries of uh, 1789. Workers are interested in money. Basically, their fundamental goal is to work, which is also, if you want, uh, still uh, our goal, uh, is to uh, work less and to be paid more. I mean, if you don't clearly have this uh, in mind, of course, you will be always, um, let's say, defeated no? by, by this process. So this actually was the goal of workers. So the, this kind of mechanism that Ford invented to lower cost of production and to increase wage was absolutely, it was really a revolution. It was uh, perhaps one of the most powerful capitalist uh, revolution through which uh, Ford uh, in a way reinvented the relationship between capital and, and, uh, and the labor subjectivity of workers. So what was actually the mechanism through which uh, Ford was able to address this kind of paradoxical uh, situation? Was actually the invention, the refinement actually of the assembly line. Of course, Ford is not the inventor of the assembly line. The assembly line is a kind of uh, technique uh, that is known already from the very beginning of industrialization from the 17th century, uh, and it was based on Adam Smith's uh, idea of uh, dividing uh, labor in order to make laboring process more efficient. And as you know, uh, the assembly line implied that uh, workers are no longer uh, producing something from beginning to the end, which was actually the, the, the way artisans usually <clears throat> let's say we're uh, producing uh, things. So, so if you would produce pots, you would produce pots from the very beginning you know, of clay to the, to the final, let's say, uh, refinements. The assembly line totally destroyed this kind of relationship between uh, work and, 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 and producer um, because actually the idea is to uh, allow the worker only to uh, produce one stage of the production process. And this actually has incredible consequences in, in terms of subjectivity. First, uh, the assembly line increased the gap you know, between uh, worker, producer, and, and the work itself. So the, the, the pro product is almost like uh, disconnected from its own, uh, let's say, pro pro productive sovereignty in a way. Uh, the second is that the assembly line, precisely for this rather mechanized and segmented uh, process of production, reduce the worker to an unskilled uh, worker. So you don't need to be trained to produce something to work at the assembly line, no? because you are just repeating the same uh, sort of thing a thousand of times, and you don't even know actually uh, what is uh, the entirety of the process. And this is actually a very important revolution that Ford will refine in an incredible way, because actually uh, you can work without any training. 
which means that you can change a job many times in uh, your life, uh, but also you have no whatsoever attachment to the work itself. No? That's actually also the, what would later on backfire this uh, incredible, uh, let's say, process of production, because of course the moment you are not attached, unlike us, uh, the moment you are not attached to your own work, you also have more reasons to revolt uh, against it. You know? But nevertheless, this the idea that uh, the worker is a uh, low skill, uh, has no whatsoever attachment to what he's producing, allow this incredible efficiency, which is exactly what, what would compensate uh, the, the high rates that uh, Ford uh, would, uh, would pay to the workers. No? I mean, the efficiency. So the, the, the problem is no longer the battleground between workers and capital is no longer actually on the very act of uh, uh, purchasing labor power, no? but is precisely on the managerial aspects of labor. I mean, how labor is organized. Um, and of course, this gave rise to this subject, uh, the working class. And what is interesting is that at precisely at the moment, no, the technique of uh, mass production and assembly lines are experimented uh, in the factory, uh, starting from the production of 4T at Highland, Highland Park um, in uh, Detroit. The same techniques of uh, man management of work are also applied uh, in uh, what we could call ma immaterial production. So not the production of uh, material goods, uh, like in the case of material production, in the case of the cars, but also in the way uh, bureaucrats uh, work. You know? And this is exactly a phenomenon that uh, in Germany in the 1920s, uh, when Hilbert Simmer is writing Gross Architecture, would be uh, defined as the rise of the Kopfarbeiter, the brain worker, no? which is very, a very interesting phenomenon because um, of course, uh, at first glance, this new class of uh, brain workers or cognitive workers, as they are called uh, today, seems to be far more emancipated no, the, of the working class. But what is interesting is precisely because these people had uh, no uh, history of class resistance against capital, at least in the 1920s, they would be even more exploited than, uh, let's say, uh, uh, industrial workers themselves. Where industrial workers in the 20s are already organized in terms of unions. They are already actually able to bargain uh, with uh, capitalists, their living and uh, wage uh, conditions. The, the Kopfarbeiters, the, the, the brain workers, uh, on the other hand, have no political representation. Actually, this will be one of the fundamental fatal mistakes that would uh, lead social democrats and especially the communist party to defeat uh, in the early 30s uh, against uh, nazism the fact that they, they, they were not able to recognize this new emerging work work working class uh, subject that of course did not have the uh, let's say representation of the traditional working class I, I think that what is interesting is that from the very beginning of these transformations, architecture play um, a very important role. I would say a primary role. And uh, just to focus on the, let's say, case of uh, Ford, uh, we cannot really uh, understand the impact of the assembly line of this new technology of uh, labor without thinking about the space in, this, in, in which this uh, technology uh, would take place. And this space actually was literally uh, designed by an architect, uh, Albert Kahn, incredible uh, prolific uh, architect who built something like, uh, well, I'm, I'm not really, I'm, I don't remember exactly the statistic, but I think something like 400 or 500 uh, buildings uh, in his life. Most of these buildings were factories. Um, uh, Albert Kahn actually uh, grew his office from, let's say, a uh, one, one or two persons business to, in fact, a factory in itself. The office of Albert Kahn when he died was something like 500 uh, people uh, office. He built factories both in US and later on also in uh, USSR. Um, and actually what is interesting was really the approach of uh, Halberg, which is of course typical of uh, American architects between 19th century and 20th century. But in Albert Kahn, this approach would become really extreme, uh, which was uh, summarized by his uh, favorite uh, motto, no? architecture is uh, 
uh, 10% art and 90% business, which means that uh, the very act of design uh, is not so much on the final outcome or in the building itself, but in the process uh, through which, uh, uh, and the technologies through which the building is basically made uh, possible. And in fact, uh, it, it was uh, precisely Albert Kahn that would refine a fundamental building technique that was already known in the United States, but with Albert Kahn would really be applied on a mass scale. And this technique was fundamentally important for uh, Le Corbusier later on, which is basically the technique of the open plan. Uh, the open plan is uh, basically something that for today, today for, for us is pretty uh, banal. Uh, most of the buildings in which we uh, live are basically typical plans. Uh, which is basically the mass production of uh, buildings. So buildings are no longer made of unique uh, elements, but elements that are uh, mass produced. So open here is not just uh, spatial openness, but also open in the sense that, of course, these elements can be easily uh, interchangeable. But of course, the open plan is also an unob unobstructed uh, space where, in fact, architecture uh, is reduced to its uh, bare structure. Uh, so uh, this is actually a fundamental revolution in the way we, uh, architecture was understood, because the primary element, and we have seen that with the previous presentations, the primary element of architecture was always the wall, basically the facade. Between 19th century, architecture is mostly a, a matter of facades. You know? We have seen how the orders, for example, which is the fundamental grammar of architecture in the, from, let's say, Vitruvius to, to the uh, 18th century, was not uh, the post lintel let's say, system, was not structural, no? was basically an ornament applied to the, to the, to the facade. No? And so the, the main technology of buildings till the 19th century are basically walls. It's only in the 19th century that with the rise of industrialization, there is a fundamental need to host unprecedented uh, amounts of people, unprecedented amount of machinery. So there is a need to ma basically make space, to basically allow the building to be uh, spacious enough to not only uh, host these new unprecedented uh, things, but also to allow the, the, the fast change of the spatial layout, uh, which in the evolution of uh, industrial techniques is uh, one of the fundamental, uh, let's say, um, fundamental actually property you know, of, of industrial architecture. We know that very well. One of the fundamental problem of how labor and transformations of labor impact the, the building is the problem of flexibility. A building has to be flexible. If a building is not flexible, programs, meaning activities, cannot really uh, reorganize themselves. No? And this problem of flexibility is first addressed in very radical terms by Albert Kahn, who actually uh, designed this. Uh, this is actually one of his first uh, typical plan uh, factories, Highland Park, Park plant in uh, Detroit. If you go to Detroit, uh, you can visit actually uh, the building, which is uh, completely abandoned. And of course, the reason why it's abandoned is, is not just because it's in Detroit, which is a city, as you know, that was so much um, uh, tied to, to this uh, man, uh, in car manufacturing that it couldn't uh, have any other economy. But actually, one of the main problem of, of Highland Park that is so big, it's a huge building. Uh, that it's impossible to basically colonize with uh, any uh, program. Uh, and this is actually one of the fundamental problems of many assembly line buildings design at that, uh, at that time. And of course, uh, a, a fourth um, figure that is very important to mention in this kind of process no, of organi reorganization of capital vis-a-vis not only the possibility of an economic crisis, but also the possibility of a working class uh, Revolution is, uh, and who is actually very important to really understand what is the purpose of uh, modern architecture is for sure John uh, Maynard Keynes, a very important uh, uh, economist who in the 1930s, especially immediately after the 1929 crisis, will uh, in fact provide uh, 
what can be considered uh, the fundamental economic theory that will save uh, capitalism from its uh, fatal, uh, let's say, destruction. No? And one of the principles of this theory uh, for uh, Keynes was to focus on what he defined and which will be a, a very important uh, trigger for, uh, modern, for the rise of modern architecture, the aggregate uh, demand. No? Uh, before Keynes, let's say before the 1929 uh, crisis, uh, capitalism is uh, seen mostly as a means of production. So basically, whoever produces on an industrial scale care only about one thing, how to produce as much as possible. And of course, this will be one of the main reasons of the 1929 crisis, to think about production, but to not think about consumption. So you cannot produce uh, if you don't uh, orchestrate a kind of uh, um, uh, cycle that's uh, linked together production and consumption. And K Keynes is the first uh, economist uh, uh, to really understand that kind of necessity, to integrate production and consumption, to make consumption part of the productive system, which means that you have to basically really think that who is producing has to also consume, and that consumption can direct, uh, can affect production itself. Um, and of course, a fundamental, uh, let's say, outcome of this theory uh, is that is the state itself that has to take the initiative uh, to basically promote consumption. So consumption becomes not just, uh, as we understand it today, a matter of, uh, let's say, greed, no? or um, how to say, like um, opulence. No? Consumption becomes a way to uh, integrate uh, the demand, I mean, what uh, Keynes called aggregate demands, which means the demand not on, of specific uh, commodities, not, but, but the whole kind of, uh, demand for uh, uh, production within production uh, uh, itself. And of course, uh, this will be the fundamental basis of what till today we know as the welfare state. The welfare state, uh, and this actually is a very important aspect which is also always misunderstood, uh, is basically a project of, for a consumerist society. It's, it's a project in which production is triggered by uh, what we always understand as its opposite, by consumption. By supporting consumption, by making actually workers, or let's say the working class, wealthy enough to consume, you basically not only establish uh, a cycle between production and consumption, but you also uh, link in a much uh, stronger way the subjectivity of workers to basically the, the mastery of production, which is the mastery of capital. Now, this is a very important because it's exactly this kind of uh, uh, relationship uh, that will be the fundamental focus, uh, of course, in, within two political, different political understanding of both Le Corbusier uh, theory of uh, architecture in the city and also uh, Hilbert Simon. I don't think you can understand what is the main, let's say, issue at stake in these two books if you don't understand this scenario, which I, for me can be really let's say, uh, be comprised between the two extremes. On one hand, uh, the Bolshevik revolution, the possibility of a revolution, uh, so the possibility of the workers to rebel against the living and working condition, and uh, on the other side, uh, the uh, Keynes understanding that the only way to counter this revolution is to transform workers from just producers to consumers. And of course, a fundamental part of this uh, consumption, of this aggregate, uh, uh, demand is household itself, is housing. So whoever wants to master uh, workers should not just provide them a job, but should provide them uh, housing, uh, education, infrastructure, transportation, which is exactly the agenda that will make modern architecture no longer an avant-garde uh, program, but basically an in in inevitable, uh, let's say, uh, program. And this is exactly what in different ways, both Le Corbusier and uh, Hilbert Simon understood uh, quite uh, early on. Well, um, I will now just uh, go through, as usual, uh, the books, uh, especially through the content list, which is uh, always a very important, uh, let's say, uh, point of entry to understand um, a book. This is, of course, Le Corbusier. As you know, Le Corbusier is a 
pseudonym of uh, Charles Edouard Jean Ray. Le Corbusier was basically the name of his grandfather, which is a very interesting uh, aspect of uh, Le Corbusier life, uh, that he changed basically his, uh, his name at a certain uh, moment of his uh, life, uh, which uh, I think has to do with the uh, sort of uh, hatred that he had for his own uh, origins. Uh, I, you know that uh, Le Corbusier was born in a, uh, I don't know if you've ever been, a Chaux de Fond, which is a small town in the Jura region uh, in Switzerland, not the most, uh, let's say, advanced urban scenario in which uh, Le Corbusier would have wished to basically uh, begin his uh, career. Uh, and also he had a very dramatic uh, relationship with this uh, town because at a certain point he, he left literally uh, his hometown through the fund because uh, his activities and especially his early attempts to uh, design were considered uh, an absolute failure. And at a certain point his mother, with whom actually Le Corbusier had a very intense uh, relationship, uh, told him uh, you really have to leave because otherwise you will not do anything good. And that was a, a, a very important, uh, let's say, moment for Le Corbusier because it was precisely when he would move in Paris that he was, not able, he was able not maybe to put in practice his own ideas immediately, but to find the right people with whom uh, actually to work on his um, ideas, which in fact from the very beginning uh, focused on this problem of mass production how to reinvent architecture from the point of view of mass production. This will be, at least till the 1940s, uh, the problem of Le Corbusier. So how to achieve an aesthetic, uh, uh, a form of architecture that can uh, address what uh, till Le Corbusier is considered completely outside uh, of architecture, uh, which is precisely the industrially uh, developed uh, architecture. I mean, what actually Albert Kahn had uh, designed already in the 1910s, uh, and Le Corbusier was a great admirer of, uh, of uh, Albert Kahn, like he was uh, Mies, uh, for example. Of course, uh, Verse in Architecture, I mean, the book that Le Corbusier wrote uh, and published in 1923, is uh, Le Corbusier's uh, most important uh, piece of writing, uh, which actually gave him instant uh, success. It was only after the publication of this book that Le Corbusier became, became a known uh, architect uh, uh, in France. The book actually had a, a huge success uh, and um, actually became a, a very important canonical text almost from, from the beginning. Uh, what is interesting is that the book was made of articles that were already being published, so it was not a new uh, material, but uh, all the chapters from the book except, I think, one, which is the... <coughs> which is the last, uh, were actually uh, material that he already had published uh, in his own uh, magazine, started in 1918, L'Esprit Nouveau, a very interesting magazine, which actually was uh, what uh, uh, Le Corbusier uh, did most, uh, I mean, uh, was basically Le Corbusier's main activity in a period between 1918, so immediately after World, World War I, to 1923, where he b practically had no job. So basically, the magazine was a way to keep himself um, alive. What is interesting about L'Esprit Nouveau, uh, it's a very interesting magazine. It's a very paradoxical magazine because it had two tendencies. Uh, on one hand, it strongly uh, put forward uh, the artistic agenda of Le Corbusier. As you know, Le Corbusier was also a painter, uh, especially in this period, uh, his main activity is painting. Uh, and Le Corbusier belonged to a movement that he founded with Amede Ozenfan called Purism, Purism uh, which is a sort of reaction against the early avant-garde, especially against uh, Cubism. And one of the, uh, let's say, uh, goal of Purism is to reconstruct uh, art, uh, uh, especially the problem of form, uh, after the deconstruction put forward by Cubism. So one of the, this is a very important, uh, Le Corbusier's ambitions are from the beginning uh, very artistic. I mean, he really stressed uh, art uh, as a sort of form of pedagogy, of mass pedagogy through which he can then introduce other topics. And of course, the main topic uh, put forward by L'Esprit Nouveau is basically mass production. Le Corbusier is a big admirer of uh, Ford. 
in the 20s, Ford published uh, his biography, which uh, is a book uh, that uh, I think one of, together with Zarathustra's uh, by Nietzsche, is the most uh, read book by uh, Le Corbusier. Le Corbusier is really a big fan of uh, Ford. He likes especially this sort of uh, combination of progressivism in terms of, uh, let's say, uh, invention of, uh, of the world. Uh, where, in fact, Ford embraced the most modern techniques of uh, uh, technology, but at the same time, how these uh, inventions are put at service for the authorities in order to master uh, the city. So, in a way, it's very important uh, to understand Le Corbusier through Ford, because Ford is exactly the kind of uh, entrepreneur or sort of uh, figure that for Le Corbusier is really uh, we actually he appealed to in order to construct his own new uh, architecture. And of course the tragedy of Le Corbusier that uh, he will never met uh, someone like Ford, you know, and that will be one of his main uh, frustrations. It, it, the clients of Le Corbusier will be far less, uh, let's say, smart and radical than, than Ford uh, uh, himself. So L'Esprit Nouveau is really a magazine that wants to create this particular a uh, purpose for architecture, to address mass production and to give to mass production an aesthetic uh, that is not just the literal uh, outcome of mass production, but has an artistic, uh, let's say, uh, goal. Of course, uh, the book is published immediately uh, after uh, the exhibition of L'Esprit Nouveau, which takes place in 1922, where uh, Le Corbusier show for the first time his main theoretical project, the city for three millions of uh, inhabitants which is a big scandal. And in fact, uh, Le Corbusier published the book the year after to kind of spoil no? that kind of uh, opportunity that he had to make a breakthrough through this uh, project in which basically he designed a city of uh, three millions of inhabitants. Very interesting is exactly the, the, stat the, the number of people living in Paris at that time. Eh? So in a way, it's an abstraction uh, of uh, a city that has to do with the problem of, of Paris. And of course, this will be precisely the anticipation of uh, the content and the purpose of, uh, of the book. What is interesting is that uh, the very first title, as you can see here in the sketch uh, for the cover for the book, uh, was not uh, vers en architecture, towards an architecture, but uh, I think what for me would have been a far better title, which is precisely Architecture or Revolution. That was actually the first idea uh, for the title. Architecture Revolution is, a, is the last chapter of the book. So in a way, uh, uh, that, that sort of goal, no? that sort of dualistic uh, understanding of architecture is the very idea that Le Corbusier has of architecture. So either we, we do architecture or we, or we allow the, uh, a revolution to happen, and of course the answer of Le Corbusier revolution can be avoided, which was the subtitle of the chapter architectural uh, revolution. Of course, uh, a striking uh, uh, aspect of, um, of uh, Le Corbusier book is the graphic design. Uh, the graphic design is uh, absolutely uh, stunning. Uh, is both uh, classical, but also very uh, straightforward. Le Corbusier used this uh, uh, you know, really very bold uh, titles, uh, which are always coupled with uh, rather extremely well-crafted images. Uh, Le Corbusier, as you might know, was a big collector of images. He had files full of all possible um, images. And of course, a very violent uh, juxtaposition. So the baptistry of Pisa uh, juxtaposed to the silos uh, in uh, US, uh, I think in, uh, in Buffalo. So, uh, and, and so these kind of violent juxtapositions, which at that time were absolutely unprecedented, really made the book uh, quite uh, uh, iconoclastic. There is actually something that I really like about Versi and Architecture is that there, there is a lot of empty space. I mean, if you flip through the book, uh, you realize that there is a lot of uh, void. I mean, there is, the book is not filled with images and, and writings. So he really wanted to create this kind of staccato technique, you know, where statements, images have their proper attention. So in a way, it's a, a, a technique, editorial technique that uh, uh, 
in a way emphasize the incredible uh, precision through which Le Corbusier always crafted uh, his books. Uh, and in fact, I, I would say that even before to read the books by Le Corbusier, and especially towards an architecture, you really have to read the graphic uh, design architecture, which is uh, very, very uh, important. And of course, the text is absolutely uh, magnificent. I mean, the, there is actually, I think that that's my idea, is that a fundamental influence on Le Corbusier's style of writing uh, is Le Doux. If you read the Le Doux architecture, uh, it has the same evocative, uh, but at the same time, sharp uh, style. I mean, what is interesting about Le Corbusier is that he is constantly wondering. Uh, there is this, a sort of wonder uh, atmosphere in his books. Uh, everything is always uh, almost revealed as a, as a kind of epiphany of something. Uh, uh, he's always like simulating a kind of surprise, no? a kind of a exclamation uh, towards what, what is happening, what he's actually discussing. But at the same time, and that's actually for me the beauty of his uh, writing style, is very precise, is very to the point. He has no uh, time to spend in what for him is bullshit. There is actually a very interesting uh, story that he tells in the, I think, Modular, uh, one other of his amazing uh, books, uh, where he describes his space of, for work. You know? Le Corbusier had a very uh, small uh, atelier uh, in Paris, uh, and uh, where actually people were really squeezed into basically what was a corridor. So his office was literally a corridor where he would just place his uh, collaborators in, uh, in battery. So when he would enter the atelier, he would uh, see almost in a kind of panoptical way if they were uh, working, because he would see just this kind of sequence of uh, drafting tables. And then at the very end of these uh, processions, this chicken battery of, of uh, so this idea of mass production is perhaps you know, very important to also understand how Le Corbusier saw his personal relationships. There, there was actually his very small office, uh, and he wrote in the modular, is very small, there are no windows, so Le Corbusier is really sitting uh, at the very entrance of this uh, cubicle. Uh, and he said, I, this is especially, uh, mm, let's say, uh, especially made to uh, allow clients to understand they have no time to waste. So after five minutes, they are in this very narrow cubicle. They want to leave. So the, the, the deal has to be made uh, and without uh, wasting time. And this is actually really a characteristic of his own way to state things. There is a, a, an incredible economy of words, which really makes uh, Le Corbusier writings, uh, from my point of view, incredibly beautiful and incredibly precise and rigorous. In, I mean, he really has a thesis. He really has something to say in very clear words. Whether it's good or bad, it's another issue. Most of it, perhaps, is not really good. Uh, but there is uh, an economy of words which, in fact, made his book and his work uh, extremely successful. Uh, so um, uh, there are two, uh, there are especially the first part is, uh, is very important, where Le Corbusier actually uh, uh, lists the three fundamental uh, uh, aspects of architecture that for him are um, very, very crucial. And of course, there is a clear reference to Vitruvius' uh, famous triad, but of course, in uh, Le Corbusier terms are volume, which are, it's, it's a chapter illustrated only with the silos, which of course is where the idea of an architectural volume comes to the fore in its utmost uh, uh, intensity. Surface, uh, which uh, Le Corbusier uh, illustrates with factories and especially with buildings by uh, Albert Kahn. And finally, the plan, which for Le Corbusier is absolutely <laughs> important. Uh, Le Corbusier understands the plan both as a uh, in the Fordist uh, uh, idea, the plan is exactly the strategy, no? What you have to basically establish before allow people to work on something. If you don't have a plan, basically uh, production will not be efficient. So that's the first meaning that Le Corbusier attached to the idea of the plan is a strategy. So there is a kind of strong emphasis on strategy as the precondition for design. But also for Le Corbusier, the plan is literally the architectural plan, the two-dimensional horizontal section that, through, uh, that for Le Corbusier is more important than the facade or the vertical elevation. 
So the, here you really have a fundamental attack on the legacy of uh, classical uh, architecture, which is not so obvious, because of course, attacks on, on classical architecture, there were plenty even before Le Corbusier, but very few people uh, have understood, and perhaps one of them was for sure Durand, that the fundamental uh, essence of an architecture that was anti-classical was precisely to understand architecture, not from its frontal appearance, uh, from its elevation, but from the idea of, of an orthogonal projection. Because it's exactly within the orthogonal projections that you can understand architecture no longer as a form of representation, but a fo as a form of management. A plan is a fundamental instrument of management rather than uh, an instrument. I mean, you, there is no representation in the plan, no? I mean, we cannot even see the plan. For example, we are in this building. We, we can't see actually how this plan works, but of course the plan has a fundamental role in, in managing space, in allowing relationships to happen, in allowing actually a, 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 an entity uh, to exist uh, in, uh, in space. And this is exactly what Le Corbusier um, emphasize in the design of architecture. What is interesting, uh, though, is that Le Corbusier, in order to uh, illustrate this concept, use uh, drawings by uh, a 19th century uh, theorist, uh, Auguste Chaussy, very important theorist who actually very much stressed drawing as a means of uh, theory. And one of the fundamental aspects of Chaussy's uh, way to approach architecture was the drawing of axonometries, I would say that uh, Chaussy is one of the first ar architect to really, uh, an engineer to really uh, use uh, axonometry as a fundamental maieutic device to really understand architecture. And what is actually the fundamental um, quality of axonometry compared to other means of representation? I mean, you are an architect, you should know why axonometry is better than perspective or even better than sections and plans. Because axonometry combine plan and volume. So for Le Corbusier, axonometry is uh, the only drawing where the relationship between how things look like and how things are organized becomes evident. That's actually why uh, the idea of Le Corbusier of the plan is not the plan of Gaspar Monge is not just the, or, or Durand, no? just the plan as an horizontal diagram. The plan for Le Corbusier is exactly the relationship between plan and volume. And it's exactly that sort of idea that will characterize Le Corbusier understanding and also design of, uh, of architecture. Of course, an, uh, an obsession of uh, Le Corbusier uh, are, uh, as, you, as you know, it's very well known, uh, liners, uh, ships. There is an entire uh, chapter that is illustrated uh, by this uh, means of transportation. Um, one of the reasons that, uh, for this fascination is, of course, that in Le Corbusier, I would say almost paranoid critical method, uh, ships are like cities, uh, self-contained uh, cities, and in fact, there is this very telling illustration where um, Le Corbusier uh, juxtaposed uh, important uh, monuments of Paris, you know, the Arche de Triomphe <laughs> and the Notre Dame, with uh, basically the profile of one uh, sh commercial uh, ship for passengers. So to really uh, show how a city uh, can be uh, organized, not just as a kind of uh, horizontal uh, sprawl, but really as, a, as, as one uh, artifact. Uh, so ships really, uh, for Le Corbusier, are, are an obsession precisely because they show a possible evolution of how to conceive uh, uh, the city. And also, the ship is the, is the, is the met, let's say, the reference through which uh, Le Corbusier makes one of his most uh, fundamental statements, you know, that living, uh, <laughs> the house uh, is, a, is a machine for living. So Le Corbusier is always precise in his own example. It's not really a guy that is uh, generous of metaphors. Uh, Le Corbusier never actually put forward uh, vague metaphors. His, his concepts are always very precise. And of course, when Le Corbusier say that the house is a machine for living, uh, it's not 
trying to uh, idealize the house literally as a machine, is referring to extreme living conditions, like the ship, for example, where in fact, literally, the house has become a machine, basically a totally mechanized uh, environment uh, in which there is no whatsoever relationship with nature, if not this kind of uh, direct uh, or straightforward relationship, like, for example, the ship has with the, with the sea, which is exactly the idea of nature that Le Corbusier has his own mind. You know? Le Corbusier buildings are always like rafts, uh, like ships uh, into this kind of ocean of green space, you know? which for Le Corbusier is really this sort of idea completely freed from the mastery of, uh, of, of architecture. Of course, airplanes are very important, but uh, at the same time, and this is actually really the main uh, aspect of towards an architecture, Le Corbusier is constantly appealing to the past which is very unique. Um, I mean, in a way, there is, of course, a clear uh, influence, which is uh, Jean Cocteau and his famous rappel à l'ordre, the return to order. So Le Corbusier is not just, uh, 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 let's say, putting himself uh, towards uh, newness, towards uh, technological innovations, but he's always balancing that uh, with a precise uh, understanding of the past. Um, there is the, one of the best chapters of Towards an Architecture is called Lesson from Rome, where he juxtaposed the early Rome, the Rome of the Greek influence and Byzantine Rome against uh, Baroque uh, Rome, because for him Baroque Rome has completely destroyed the sense of order and essential, let's say, essentialism in form that informed, for example, uh, early uh, Roman, ancient Rome, and especially Byzantine Rome. There is this very famous uh, drawing in which uh, he take a detail of Pietro Ligorio's uh, map of Rome, and he abstract this map as a kind of sequence of pure uh, abstract platonic uh, objects. So you see how, paradoxically, Le Corbusier constantly bridge uh, mass production with uh, the most uh, ancient and essential concept of artistic uh, production, like for example in this, uh, in this image. And of course, this is immediately uh, linked to his own concern about precisely mass production. While actually, uh, uh, one of the main goal of Versen Architectura is to promote his uh, invented uh, building methods, like for example, Maison Domino, which is exactly a house uh, that is uh, no longer uh, made of walls or facade, but made of uh, its pure essential structure. You see how the Maison Domino, it's a reinterpretation of basically the uh, uh, Fordist uh, uh, factory. He, uh, Le Corbusier literally, uh, actually it's interesting, the, the, the Maison Domino is designed in 1914. Uh, so one year after uh, High Highland Park by Albert Kahn is completed. Uh, and there is a, a clear emulation of Le Corbusier towards that building. Uh, but the difference, of course, is that uh, Le Corbusier applied this technology uh, into, into uh, housing. Of course, one characteristic of this building, uh, first of all, that uh, it's a building that can be self-built by his, um, uh, its inhabitants. So it's a building that doesn't need an architect to be uh, producer. Uh, it's a building that is uh, addressing the low-skill worker, no? the worker of the assembly line, because one of the characteristics of this uh, worker is that he has no skills uh, except the very simple rudimental technology that is needed in order to build this, uh, this uh, prototype, uh, which Le Corbusier uh, states can be completed in three days. So the same kind of efficiency that Ford is, in a way, trying to instill uh, in the assembly line is actually also uh, at work uh, in the Maison Domino with a difference, I would say, that uh, in a very interesting way, the Maison Domino has this very innovative sort of uh, character, no? an house that is completely empty, that can host what everything, whatever, but it has also this kind of archaic um, aesthetic. It looks almost like uh, a post and lintel Greek uh, uh, building. No? Uh, and I think this kind of uh, oxymora of uh, a sort of almost archaic uh, classicism and the technology of mass production is exactly what characterizes Le Corbusier's uh, works. Now, um, unfortunately, I have spoiled um, 
my entire hour on Le Corbusier, which I think was, of course, he, he would des he deserve um, uh, so much space. So I will be very short, unfortunately, on Hilbert Simer, because I have to say that, uh, um, and that's not really professional to say, but I'm a big fan of Hilbert Simer. And in a way, I prefer Hilbert Simer than Le Corbusier. I mean, these are really those kind of things like, uh, you know, I think it was Yeats on, or, or Keats that say that, uh, you know, you always have to choose between Plato and Aristotle, you know? At a certain point of your life, there are always two, two ways to go, you know? Which are, take the form of two fundamental figures, which either could be Plato and uh, Aristotle, or the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. And I think for me, it was really Le Corbusier and Hilbert Simer. So uh, I always felt that you have to choose between these two uh, approaches to, to architecture. And I have to say that uh, on, I, I, I have a big uh, admiration for Hilbert Simer, who I think is considered by, I think, most of historians and critics of architecture as, I think, one, one of the worst uh, architects ever uh, existed in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the world. Uh. Uh, but I think this is largely based on the fact that uh, most of the work that is known by Hilbert Simer are his drawings. Uh, and a uh, lot of people ignore basically his uh, literary production. The, um, Hilbert Simer had produced uh, in his own life something like 13 books. And actually, I have to say that uh, some of them are quite, uh, not only quite beautiful, but also extremely articulated, uh, uh, far more than what uh, architects, especially at that time, could, uh, could really write. But what characterized, as I said before, uh, Hilbert Simer's writing style is that he's extremely uh, detached. Hilbert Simer is far more analytical than Le Corbusier. Le Corbusier really has a message to uh, transmit. Uh, he has a, very often a propaganda uh, attitude towards his own uh, theories. Uh, he's really a seller of his own uh, work. Uh, on the contrary, uh, Hilbert Simer is very uh, detached. He used actually his own work to illustrate his own concept, but never as a kind of uh, clearly uh, uh, stated uh, ideas about architecture, but more as problems about architecture. Uh, and you can see also in the in the in this photograph, no, he, his persona was very characteristic. He was known as a very shy uh, person. Uh, someone who would always hide uh, in, in the shadow of Mies, who was his uh, closest friend, and in fact, uh, a person with whom he had collaborated uh, very often. And in fact, it's very interesting, the relationship between Hilbert Simer and Mies, uh, because Mies is one of the few architects of the modern movement uh, that has n didn't produce a theory about the city. Mies has always focused on, on architecture, or on, let's say, on urban design on exceptional uh, uh, occasions. Uh, while on the contrary, Hilbert Simer has produced very little architecture. As far as I know, he has only realized one building, uh, which was a villa uh, commissioned to him by uh, Mies himself for the Weisenhof uh, in Stuttgart. Uh, of course, uh, Hilbert Simer is, I would say, largely responsible for one of Mies' more successful projects, which is the Lafayette Park in Detroit, which uh, apparently, uh, of course, is always credited to Mies, but from recent uh, uh, historical research, it's, it's quite certain that most of the design of the project was by uh, Hilbert Simer. So it's interesting, also a person that was so, not so much uh, attached to authorship, uh, contrary to Le Corbusier, who was, as you know, obsessed uh, in a kind of maniacal way with, uh, with authorship. And in fact, one of the rumors that was uh, known when Le Corbusier published uh, Towards an Architecture was that the book was written also by Amédée Ozenfan. Um, so, uh, well, on the contrary, uh, Hilbert Simer was always someone trying to uh, reject uh, a strong authorship on architecture in order really to focus on ideas rather than on, on, on forms. And in fact, his buildings are as anonymous as, uh, as possible. Uh, Grosse Architecture is published in 1927, and it's uh, absolutely clear that the book is written as a response to Le Corbusier towards an architecture. Um, I mean, really, he really writes this book uh, as a kind of counter 
book to, uh, I mean, of course, Hilbert Simer is a big admirer of Le Corbusier, but also, is also very critical of him. And in fact, already the title for me is very telling. Uh, Le Corbusier title is Towards an Architecture. So for Le Corbusier, it's clear that architecture comes first. So the city is nothing without, without its architecture. So uh, the only way the city can exist is through basically an architectural project. And of course, the city of three millions of inhabitants makes clear that uh, the, the plan, the architectural plan, or let's say the urban plan is a fundamental sine qua non for uh, understanding how the modern city can work. On the contrary, uh, in uh, Hilbert Seimer, the city comes first. Grosstad architecture means the architecture of the big city. So he's not talking about just buildings. He's not actually putting forward a theory of what could be the aesthetic of modern uh, buildings. Uh, on the contrary, Hilbert Seimer is scarcely interested in, in problems of style, and the examples he analyzes in the book are rather eclectic in terms of a kind of stylistic, uh, uh, stylistic uh, characteristics. No? He is more concerned about what are the new problems put forward by the capitalist city. That, as I said before, for uh, Hilbert Sammer, introduced a quantum leap in our understanding of uh, uh, the city. Actually, um, what is interesting is, the, is really the content list. I, I, we have seen before how Le Corbusier, um, let's say, uh, content list is very argumentative. Le Corbusier does not put forward this theory through programs. Actually, Le Corbusier's book is not encyclopedic at all. It's a book is really made of theses, of arguments, which is exactly how usually an idea should be put forward. On the contrary, uh, Hilbert Seimer content list is far more dry and more encyclopedic. Actually, what is interesting is that the chapters of the book are 10. So he's literally appropriating the Libri Deshem uh, uh, model, you know, the model of uh, Vitruvius and Alberti. 10 is the symmetrical uh, number, the perfect number that really organized the knowledge as really an encyclopedia, which, uh, as the term uh, address, has to do with, let's say, circling things, making things in a way uh, like almost like a, a loop, a universe that can contain all uh, knowledge. So, in a way, uh, Il Bersami is really mimicking that kind of uh, idea. But what I, I really like about this content list, it's, it's very dry, but there is something very special about it. If you read the book, uh, actually the book uh, has one, uh, the first chapter and the last chapter are the most conceptual uh, chapters. The chapters where Hilbert Simon really condense his argument, uh, which is in two steps. First, we have a problem, which is the metropolis. And then we have a solution which is the metropolis architecture. Basically, an architecture that is uh, designed especially for this new uh, urban uh, reality. And then, uh, in between these two chapters, he has all these um, typologies, which he put forward as the new programs of the capitalist city. Urban planning, residential buildings, commercial buildings, high rises, halls and theaters, transport building, industrial buildings. So he goes from the most basic uh, let's say, primary elements of the city to the most uh, specialized. No? It's very interesting. We will see next week that uh, Aldo Rossi will be very much influenced by this uh, structure of, of the book. In fact, I mean, the title, The Architecture of the City, was really understood as a kind of uh, appropriation of Hilbert Seimer's, uh, let's say, uh, title. But my, actually, I mean, if you read the book, uh, you can almost do an experiment, which I... I mean, if I would have time, I would really like to do one day. You can basically uh, take the first and the last chapter, and you can rewrite completely the chapters in between. Uh, and basically, the book will uh, still be relevant. <laughs> in other words, uh, what for me is great about uh, Grosset Architecture is that uh, there is one part which is fixed, the first and the last uh, chapter, and one part which is very uh, flexible, which can change according to the given specific historical time. And this is exactly why uh, in Hilbert Seimer the two, the two parts are clearly distinct. So in architecture there is always something that remains, a fixed theory through which we can organize the design task uh, 
uh, in order the, that uh, address the CD. And then there is something that always change, which is exactly the typological uh, issues. I mean, how to address new programs which might happen, but also uh, disappear. Unlike Le Corbusier, uh, Hilbert Summer is not at all interested in, in the building as a unique uh, artifact, something that is very often the uh, reference for Le Corbusier, you know? think of the grain silos uh, images, you know, where the singularity of the building is very well uh, stress. You know? On the contrary, uh, Hilbert Summer is interested in the singular cell of the building, in the apartment, in the subunit, in what actually makes the city not from the point of view of buildings, but from living conditions. And in fact, there are a lot of examples that really concern, uh, especially in residential buildings, the problem of how to organize the layout of residential buildings. The most uh, um, interesting uh, uh, scheme is a, a scheme that is designed by Hilbert Seimer uh, himself, where he actually study a, a new uh, residential layout where living and, and, and uh, you would call the living parts and the bedrooms, the sleeping part of the apartment, are clearly um, separated. Uh, first of all, in order to first to maximize the daylight uh, performance, but also to allow flexibility. So for example, he invents this kind of, uh, well, he appropriates this kind of walls that contains all the furniture. So if you separate uh, living from, from sleeping, you can uh, have, you can basically uh, change the number of rooms without affecting the general layout of, of the building. This is actually something that for us might be very banal, but at that time, this sort of understanding of the house as a very flexible layout that eventually can emerge to apartments as one big apartment, or on the contrary, can be reduced to a very small uh, living unit uh, becomes, becomes possible. You see that the only fixed elements are basically the, the services, which are all clustered <laughs> in one uh, part, uh, and the stairs, the vertical circulation. All the rest can change, basically. It's almost like, I mean, walls are literally conceived like furniture. Of course, the, uh, a, a very important uh, example put forward in uh, Grosse d'Architecture is uh, Hilbert Seimer design for a vertical uh, city. I'm not going to explain you this project, which is uh, very important for Hilbert Seimer uh, thesis, but uh, just to let you know that uh, the project is designed as a critique of Le Corbusier uh, city of three million of inhabitants, and one of the fundamental uh, aspects that uh, Hilbert Seimer put forward uh, is the idea to uh, uh, criticize what for Le Corbusier is still a very important technique of planning, which is zoning. I don't know if you ever heard about the word zoning. Zoning is to distribute the different programs of the city uh, horizontally. So you have a business district, so you have a residential area, and you have an industrial area. I mean, it might be a, a very obsolete technique, but our cities are still rely on that kind of uh, planning uh, uh, reality. Uh, um, Hilbert Seimer actually proposed a, a totally radical new uh, reorganization of the city, where in fact working activities uh, and living, uh, commercial and living uh, uh, activities are, um, let's say, composed vertically. They all happen in the same, uh, in the same place. Of course, uh, Hilbert Seimer is addressing the city of the Kopfarbeiter, of the brain worker, where there are no factories uh, anymore, but there are only office buildings. So he can really organize the city uh, as, a, as a place where living and work uh, happen basically everywhere. Uh, if uh, Le Gourbouzier is addressing Paris with a city of three million of inhabitants, of course, uh, Hilbert Seimer is addressing Berlin, which uh, at that time is emerging as one of the most powerful uh, cities in terms of tertiary uh, economy in, in the world. I mean, only in Berlin there were, between in the 1920s, something like 50 newspapers. So imagine just the kind of uh, number of uh, uh, clerks and, and journalists that would uh, be simply the outcome of that particular uh, labor reality of, um, of the city. So you see how <laughs> Hilbert Seimer uh, is, uh, unlike Le Corbusier, is no longer uh, trying to uh, separate the different uh, parts of the city, but he conceived the city as, a, as, as, one, as one plan. 
And of course, uh, if Le Corbusier had applied the techniques of building mass production to domestic space, uh, it's precisely uh, Hilbert Seimer and of course uh, Mies uh, as well, in the same period that apply the techniques of uh, industrial buildings to office buildings. I mean, this is a famous, uh, the famous um, uh, competition entry for the Chicago Tribune. Uh, Chicago Tribune competition, I don't know if you ever heard about it, was the first, uh, let's say, large scale international competitions um, ever organized till that moment by the Chicago Tribune, which was a very important daily uh, of uh, Chicago, and in 1922, uh, if I'm not wrong, launched a big competition to turn the Ron headquarters into the new icon for Chicago. So it's the first time where this kind of concern for building, no? not just as an accommodation of space, but as a representation of a particular corporate interest uh, is clearly stated, uh, which was precisely in the brief uh, of the competition. In fact, most of the projects presented to this competition, from Grobius to Bruno Taut, but also from very successful American architects, were very much concerned with the idea of representing through architecture the prestige of this, uh, uh, let's say, of the Chicago Tribune itself. On the contrary, um, Hilbert Seimer, who did not uh, submit his competition entry. He used the brief in order to illustrate his idea about office space, uh, produced this building, which is absolutely unremarkable in terms of form, because the building itself is simply, uh, you see actually, by the way, the, the original drawing. Uh, this is actually the drawing that Hilbert Simer did for the magazine Ge, and this is actually the original drawings of the competition entry, which apparently was never, was never sent. Uh. And it's very unclear why, why he didn't send uh, the project, uh, but nevertheless was published uh, afterwards. But the most uh, shocking, uh, the sh most shocking uh, aspect of the project, of course, is the plan. The plan is a literal uh, application of the Albert Kahn typical plan, no longer for an industrial building, but for an office building. And of course, a fundamental purpose of this open space was to allow the organization, the layouts of the building to take basically any form uh, possible. So you see actually why um, uh, Hilbert Seimer uh, made uh, clear from the beginning that with the capitalist city, uh, the problem of design, the problem of what architecture is supposed to produce radically changed. No? Because in fact, as you see in this project, the problem of architecture is no longer the problem <coughs> of representation. I mean, till the 18th century, and I would say also the 19th century, the problem of architecture is a, is a problem of representing something, of using architecture as a form of representation. Uh, from the 20th century, with these new uh, revolutions, both the Industrial Revolution, but also the Proletarian Revolution, the problem is no longer a problem of representation. The problem is a problem of management. So there is no architecture that can represent uh, an idea of management. No? So Le Corbusier, so you see actually the two answers. No? Le Corbusier tried to go deep into this problem of mass production in order to find a new epic for architecture. And for me, the ambiguity of the Maison Dominant, which is both a, let's say, poor, uh, simple, uh, Fordist almost produced um, flexible building, but at the same time, an archaic post lintel almost Greek uh, monument makes that paradox quite apparent. Uh, but on the, on the other hand, actually, uh, you have Hilbert Seimer, who has no whatsoever uh, goal or ambition to redeem this uh, new abstract uh, reality of mass production. No? But uh, on the contrary, to give to this reality its most uh, intense and radical uh, form. No? Exactly like Musil, uh, in his famous novel, The Man Without Qualities, I try to give to the kind of disorienting uh, scale of modernization uh, a representation that is no longer a representation. No? In fact, uh, I don't know if you ever read this uh, novel, but well, by the way, I don't think you can really understand what was the 20th century without having read uh, Musil, uh, uh, Men Without Qualities. And the problem of that novel, that there is no longer a novel that can contain the world. The world actually far exceed 
the narrative structure of a novel. This is exactly what Hilbert Simer, which from my point of view is the muzil of architecture, uh, understood. There is no way we can contain, we can give form uh, to, uh, to the world uh, without actually achieving this kind of uh, <laughs> literal tabula rasa of architecture. And it's exactly on this tabula rasa that uh, every uh, architect after uh, Hilbert Simer, but also after uh, Mies and uh, Le Bourbier, had to rebuild, uh, in a way, an idea of architecture, which I think is still the problem that we have today when this sort of uh, attempt to erase, to hide uh, the tabula rasa of the modern city has uh, produced this kind of uh, uncontainable surplus of architectural diversity. So in a way, I would like to conclude today by saying that uh, for me, both books uh, have reached a point where we have almost uh, on an equal uh, basis uh, the most uh, dramatic crisis of, of architecture and its uh, purpose. But at the same time, perhaps uh, the way in which uh, architecture was uh, radically reinvented uh, is something that uh, goes beyond uh, the problem of representation and became uh, an idea of space, uh, fr um, let's say, beyond uh, uh, its uh, iconographic and, uh, and aesthetic, uh, let's say, uh, appearance. But of course, I think this sort of uh, dilemma is still today with us, and I think uh, that uh, I still wait for convincing uh, answers. And to be honest, uh, and that's actually why I really wanted to spend more time maybe on these two books, uh, for me, uh, both Versen uh, Architecture and uh, Grostad Architecture remains the most uh, Import the, the last most important buildings, um, let's say, well, buildings. They are also kind of buildings, but most important books written not only on architecture, but also on what uh, architecture is, to, is supposed to be. Thank you. Are we, we have not, oh no, you are, so sorry, I thought that you were responsible for um, there are questions. I mean, if you have to leave, uh, but if there are two or three questions, I would be very glad to, to answer. And I really apologize for this time going far beyond the one hour slot. No questions? Yes, one. Yes. So they're kind of back there, but yet architecturally, they're kind of like importing all this stuff from you know, the late 20th century. And so, so there, there's this kind of weird um, cyclical, I don't know what to call it, uh, intersection. Yeah. No, I, I think you're right. I mean, I also thought, uh, I mean, I thought myself a lot, you know, whether or not uh, Asia and especially China <coughs> are comparable to what was Europe and US a century ago, no? Uh, and of course, the reality is completely different. The mentality also is very different, but there is something that I, I think that in this comparison is missing uh, from, the, from what is happening today which actually was very important uh, in, the, in the beginning of the 20th century, which in fact uh, made the possibility for architecture to really invent something, uh, which was the uh, role of uh, bargaining um, unions. Uh, one of the, for me, shame of the uh, history of modern architecture is uh, to have underestimated the role of those parties or associations uh, or groups uh, that uh, uh, were trying to uh, force uh, capital, so to, make, to take measures uh, in order to basically reform his uh, sort of forms of exploitation. Well, for example, uh, there is a thesis, uh, one of the best uh, uh, book on Le Corbusier, which has, unfortunately has never been published, and I really blame the author uh, 
uh, for that, uh, who is Mary McLeod, uh, who wrote her PhD thesis on the uh, right-wing unionism of Le Corbusier. Le Corbusier was clearly a conservatist uh, architect, uh, but uh, with a clear understanding of the role of corporation, workers' corporations and, and unions in basically making demands to capital in order to basically better social and living conditions. So he was uh, very attached to that kind of uh, way of understanding the problem of architecture. I mean, architectural revolution was precisely a right-wing uh, uh, unionist uh, uh, slogan, which he appropriated. And I think that was a very important also for uh, architects like uh, Hilbert Seimer. Hilbert Seimer was clearly associated with the Social Democratic uh, Party, the SPD in, uh, in Germany. So their uh, uh, sort of project was, it's an understandable without that sort of impetus towards reformism. So the project of modern architecture is the project of reformism. It's not to overthrow uh, capital, but to allow capital to better its, uh, let's say, social living conditions in order to allow workers to be more attached to its mastery. And of course, consumption play a fundamental role. The problem of many, the uh, new uh, capital development in, in many of these regions that you mentioned is that the role of unions is zero. There are no bargaining uh, agencies that negotiate between workers and, and capital. So capital is almost like uh, backfiring itself. Uh, I mean, it's unable basically to, to use uh, development uh, as a form of more kind of generalized uh, progress. Uh, and I think that's, that's why there is no architecture. I mean, architecture is not something like a painting that you can invent uh, yourself. Uh, you need an authority. You need some kind of reference to produce a project for the city of, of this particular scale. And Le Corbusier had very clear reference. He, Le Corbusier wanted to appeal to very specific uh, clients, like, for example, Ford, who, of course, he would identify in this very enlightened uh, capitalist, uh, let's say, uh, leaders. These kind of figures, uh, like Rathenau, for example, in Germany, these kind of figures today, they don't exist. I mean, and that's actually why there is no such a program, such a project for, for, for architecture, and especially in, this, uh, in these countries. I don't know if my answer has... Well, but even be, it's, for me, even it's, it's not immediately an architectural problem. It's here a, a problem of the way um, development is organized. There are forms of development. For example, in the 19th century, capitalist development didn't need architecture at all. It was simply a very rudimental form of exploitation. Only in the 20th century, when basically the management of these masses of workers becomes an urgent task, there is actually a program for architecture, which is to basically design housing models, new uh, infrastructure, new plans for the city. Uh, but now I think we are living in a similar situation that, that was in 19th century, where in fact the welfare, uh, let's say, aspect of, uh, of capitalism is completely gone. And that's actually why, I mean, if you, are, if you are an architect today, you can design a museum, a gallery, uh, a renovation for an apartment, but you can hardly uh, think about the mass production of housing, the mass production of uh, certain really general programs for the city. Because that kind of demand, the aggregate demand you know, that uh, Keynes put forward is basically uh, missing, is not actually organized. It exists because there is an, still an aggregate demand for basic social infrastructures, and we know that uh, very well when we search for a house, affordable house or affordable uh, transportation, which here in London is basically a, a crime, no? that we have to pay so much to, to go to work. Eh? These are exactly the problems that made uh, modern architecture important uh, a century ago, which today are completely uh, absent. But actually what is interesting, uh, 
uh, about Le Corbusier, and that's actually why, for me, is a, still a very important example that he put forward this program uh, even before a crisis, uh, which was the 1929 crisis, would make evident that this sort of agenda was very urgent. So he almost, I mean, I always like to say that Le Corbusier predates Keynes. Keynes comes after Le Corbusier. For sure, Keynes have never read uh, Le Corbusier. But basically, what is really, for me, interesting about Le Corbusier, who was an architect at the end, uh, almost predates uh, what Keynes would theorize uh, in economic terms. Yeah. One agenda that has to do with the problem of production, but at the same time, as he was showing us, uh, <coughs> he has a uh, kind of artistic agenda. And do Hilversheimer has any um, artistic ag agenda? Or, or, or I could also say uh, an idea of, <coughs> of creating a sort of composition I'm reading this through uh, the article of uh, Alan Colhoun, uh, uh, Composition versus uh, uh, Project. So I don't know if something. I think it's a very good point. Um, actually, as you said, it's true. Le Corbusier is always mediating between the extremes of mass production and his artistic um, sensibility. We should not forget that he's a painter. I mean, his first aspiration was to become a painter. So he really sees the problem through, for him, art and aesthetics uh, form uh, is really a pedagogical framework through which one can educate he or herself towards the problems of mass production, which is to do, for example, to be confronted with a new generic uh, uh, produce environment, you know, which Le Corbusier really tried to see through artistic terms. Now, in Hilbertsheimer, there is an apparent rejection of that. For Hilbertsheimer, there is no artistic redemption of, uh, of uh, mass production. On the contrary, he makes the things even more uh, evident. But uh, what is interesting about uh, Hil Hilbertsheimer is that uh, he was a prolific writer, but especially in the 1920s, uh, he was a prolific art critic. He wrote a lot about art, uh, and not only about modern art, uh, but also on uh, art of the past, uh, Baroque architecture, but also artists, Morandi, De Chirico, uh, Georg Grotz, so, you know, and especially Kurt Witters, who I think is a very important artist for Hilbertsheimer. And for him, actually, uh, there is, so that means that there is a, a, a sort of aesthetic layer in Hilbertsheimer work. I mean, his drawings for me are, I mean, they, there is something for me, I mean, it's a bit like, uh, if you want, the work of Gerhard Richter. You know, Richter always said, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know what I'm painting. Uh, I think, I don't believe in what I'm painting. Uh, my paintings are boring. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if you have read, read his text. He always stated that his work has, is about nothing. Uh, but then, of course, uh, there is an incredible artistic uh, eloquence in his own images. For me, actually, is this, I mean, in a way, Hilbertsheimer has the same approach. I mean, he's very crude in accepting the absolute reification of the industrial world. But at the same time, in the, in the images he produced, which are, I have to say, uh, scary, but also very beautiful, and you really have to see these drawings uh, alive. There was an exhibition on the, at the MoMA where you could see, actually, some of these uh, drawings are really stunning. I mean, there is something that has an artistic uh, integrity, but it's far less evident and for sure not at all stated uh, or little stated by, by Hilbertsheimer. There is only one text where Hilbertsheimer makes clear his own kind of also artistic ambitions, which is the will to form. Uh, and this text, in fact, in the translation uh, of the Metropolis architecture, uh, the editor decided to add this text to the translation. Because there you really understand that the, let's say, artistic agenda of, uh, of Hilbert Seimer. 
Um, I was wondering if you could tell us anything about uh, uh, Le Courbusier and in the United States. Mm -hmm. As we are aware of, you only had the occasion, the chance to build one and a half building. And um, yeah, I mean, from what you're s telling us, basically he proposed the solution for, and it actually worked in a way for, um, to, to avoid a sort of uprising of the working class Yes. So I was, I was wondering, why didn't he, what forces acted so that he couldn't join the New Deal rebuilding? Uh, well, uh, actually, uh, <coughs> the biography of Le Corbusier, I don't know if you ever read a biography of his life. I don't know if you ever, uh, well, if you do it, you will become very depressed because you discovered that uh, his life was a sequence of bitter failures. Huh? And for sure, one of the bitterest uh, failure of, of Le Corbusier is his attempt to conquer uh, US. He really wanted to go to US. For him, Paris and France were just a stopover <coughs> towards his trajectory from the Jura, from Chez de Fond to basically uh, Detroit or Chicago or New York. But of course, um, Astafuri actually described very well the problem of. Uh, and, and call us as well in the Lewis New York, which you know, has a chapter uh, de devoted to Le Corbusier trying to, to, to deal with the American city, is that uh, the consequences of what he had seen uh, were so far from any architectural, uh, let's say, uh, understanding uh, that, uh, that at the end he could only, um, as you said, uh, address the most, uh, let's say, evident uh, aspects of it. No? Uh, and that's actually why he, he never succeeded in, in selling his own work to American, for example, industrialists. No? I mean, in a way, what they were doing was already actually what he was theorizing, but in a way that was far more uh, socially and, and politically organized. Uh, and that's actually why, to his great uh, regret, uh, he never succeeded to make really something. Uh, at, I mean, he built something, but not uh, at the level of the ambitions he had uh, put forward uh, at the beginning of his career. Nevertheless, uh, I think uh, he's uh, looking to US, uh, to the New Deal, to that kind of entrepreneurial activism uh, that is very important in the American culture was absolutely a fundamental reference for Le Corbusier. Actually, there is uh, always a little kind of uh, comment uh, that uh, you know, he was trying to appeal to fascist uh, and to communist uh, almost at the same time. But in fact, the real, uh, authorite, the real authorities to which Le Corbusier was uh, appealing uh, was basically the authority of uh, of the American uh, enlightened uh, entrepreneur. That, that would have been his ideal client, but I think his work was so didascalic you know, uh, that uh, only someone like Albert Kahn could really work with that kind of uh, machinery. I think it was uh, far beyond already uh, Le Corbusier. Albert Kahn, I always make a joke that Albert Kahn is the real Kahn. Uh, <laughs> was really even, I mean, in a way, not in terms of architecture, which it was very conservative and rudimental, but in terms of really how to address this machinery of mass production was far more advanced than Le Corbusier. And also, he, when he finally arrived to US, he's already so famous. I mean, he's almost like Zahadid, so people don't take him really seriously. I mean, they don't. I mean, they gave him a, like a nice project, uh, a museum or uh, whatever, uh, but they don't take him seriously. In what actually, for me, Le Corbusier is more important because <laughs> basically, Le Corbusier as a planner, as as a designer of of cities, of an idea of the city, that that will not succeed in uh, in US, and he will be. You know, there is this little anecdote that Colas uh, put at the end of the chapter on Le Corbusier, no? that uh, he, he, he feels these uh, doors that are closed uh, no? behind him, but he repeats to himself, I'm right, I'm right, I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
towards an architecture is kind of programmatic and perhaps more in the line of the treatises, uh, prescript, uh, like a prescription of what architecture should be. Uh, so, and this is more like found architecture yes. uh, in, the gross, in the big city. But is it, is it pres prescriptive? In a way, or well, it's prescriptive uh, in, in a way that uh, a retroactive manifesto can be prescriptive. Uh, I mean, in a way, Gross Architecture is really a retroactive manifesto because uh, most of the material uh, Hilbertheimer is dealing with is something that has been already uh, designed or realized. So it's not really starting from scratch. Uh, in, Le, in Le Corbusier, it's different. Of course, he's also, you know, he's using the Parthenon, but is using also objects that have nothing to do with the architectural design. On the contrary, Bersheimer only focuses on architecture and on things that already exist. So there is a pres an element of prescription, which doesn't work through, uh, let's say, uh, arguments. Uh, I mean, there are arguments, of course, but not, not with the same straightforwardness of Le Corbusier, but more through examples. Um, so in a way, uh, I would say that uh, Wilbersheimer is less prescriptive than, than Le Corbusier, but for that reason, even more persuading uh, in framing the problem that, that architecture has to address. You don't feel that kind of pressure that you feel with Wilbersheimer, uh, sorry, with Le Corbusier, that you really have to take things from that particular angle. Uh, Wilbersheimer is form, far more um, uh, generous in offering uh, a repertoire of solutions without saying this is the right one, no? But of course, uh, especially when he proposes examples like, like this one or the vertical city, uh, he's clearly aiming to arrive to an idea of architecture, which is very precise, which is the idea that architecture becomes this pure, almost empty volume, uh, which will be the architecture of meals. I mean, at the end, uh, what really uh, Hilbertheimer is theorizing is what Mies would design as, as an architect. Yes, one uh, last. <laughs> I <don't know. clears throat> um, when you were talking about the domino, uh, you interpreted as a, a version of, um, or as an evolution of Albert Kahn's uh, prototype of the Ford factory. No, uh, well, not really upper class. The Ford, you mean the. No, I said Al Al Albert Kahn. Albert Kahn, sorry, yes, yes. Not upper class. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. And um, so I understood upper class. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> so, and uh, as a as a model of uh, you know uh, technological device that could be easily easily reproduced. Yeah. And uh, I think you also said the building that doesn't need an architect, which. Sounded to me a bit strange, knowing that Le Corbusier was so obsessed with, uh, you know, uh, the authority of the architect and uh, himself, you know, imposing his name everywhere. And um, furthermore, when thinking about the domino as a as a construction model that was not actually something that could be um, technically produced very easily in mass production, even Le Corbusier himself didn't manage to build it the the right way, as he imagined. Yes. Um, I was actually wanting you to comment on this. Uh, was it more like a model that he proposed for mass production, or more like a, a novelty, a technological novelty that himself um, liked to, uh, you know, present as, as, as something as a both. I would yeah. say both. I mean, for sure, there is uh, an aspect of invention. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there is a very famous story about the design of Maison Domino, which actually was done when he was still in the Chaux de Fonds. Uh, it's actually one of the last years he's there. And, uh, you know, most of the ideas from Maison Domino comes from his uh, studies of uh, uh, vernacular architecture, uh, especially Turkish um, houses, where in fact the whole structure of the building is made of uh, timber and all the rest is basically, and also Flemish uh, houses. So there is a, an element of vernacular architecture no, from in, in the Maison Domino. And also the absence of the beam. Exactly, 
uh, which will be the fundamental innovation, the absence of the beams is the fundamental invention of Le Corbusier to merge basically the, the, the floors and the beam in one, in one element. Actually, I, unfortunately, I didn't have the sketch. There is a sketch where you really see how Le Corbusier goes from the post lintel beam things to basically merging beams and, and, and structure together, basically, and floor together. But, um, you know, there is a story that where he really wants, once he arrived to this model, he really wants to patent it. He wants to make, a, he wants to make money out of it. Uh, and one of his friends told him, look, this invention is so banal that why you have to make a patent out of it? Uh, because it was something so generic uh, that uh, in a way has this paradox that uh, in a way it's a very innovative building, but at the same time is exactly what later on and not because Le Corbusier was pushing for the project, it almost happened because actually there was this huge population of people that had to be housed. Uh, later on, this has become the most successful model for uh, what we call today informal <coughs> cities, uh, which is exactly a domino project, uh, which can be self-built uh, without uh, architects, uh, but nevertheless, and this is a very important aspect, that you still need construction materials, so profit can still be appropriated by large construction companies. So this kind of idea of informality is very relative. And of course, there is no need for an architect. I mean, here Le Corbusier is uh, really uh, affirming his own authorship uh, using a model which is exactly the opposite of authorship. But as you said, and I completely agree with you, it's a way through which we understand how Le Corbusier was so, you know, obsessed with the idea of authorship that he would also pay the extreme consequences of you know, abandoning any form of authorship in, in order to impose his own mastery. And I think that's actually what is great about, at the end, his, his work, what is great and, and to a certain extent tragic you know, about, about his work. But uh, I think that uh, he really wanted to invent um, a, an outdoor-less um, architecture. That, that was definitely one of the ambitions behind the Maison Domino. And he succeeded in a way. It's the, his most uh, successful building at the end. <laughs> okay, see you next week. Thank you.